Welcome back to another episode of the Noble and Roosh Show, hosted by Ball is Life. I'm your host, Bruce Williams, with my co-host, Zach Noble. And today we have none other than the Atlanta Hawks shooting guard, Kevin Werder. I hope I'm saying that right, by the way. Kevin, where are you coming from today, man? How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Uh, I've actually, I'm in Atlanta, back here, hanging out here for a couple of weeks. Going to start working out again. Um, yo, just had a couple of things going on, but I'm doing good. Thank you guys for having me on. What did you have on this morning? Workouts or just personal stuff? Uh, a couple of personal stuff. Had a, had a lift to go on. Got to get my career registered here in Atlanta. It's always a fun thing to do. So got a couple of ratings. Trying to save what, my foot off to the line. You're what registered? Said I got to get my car re-registered. Oh, that's the word. Been yeah, I've been registered in New York now. I got to get it re-registered to Atlanta. The state of Georgia is going to be coming for that ass with some taxes. So. <laughs> yeah, they are. Hey, Bruce, can you from... turn your volume up a little bit? You sound a little muffled. Great. If you're listening, pause. Pause and edit. What? Does it sound better? Need a little more. No, what? need more. What are you talking about? Is this, is this, this is the same setting I always have. What's going All on? right, we'll make it work, but it sounds a little. Hold on. One second. Hey, pause the recording so Gray knows where to edit. Got it. So, Kevin, um, with the offseason underway, man, have you have you been taking some time to kind of just chill and and basically, you know, wind down or have you just gone right back into it no days off no we've definitely taken some time to chill um you know the season ended you know, it took about a week I didn't do didn't do really anything it was more just you know hanging around trying to get my body back um I went home for my day kind of surprised my mom went home for a couple of days and ended up staying for a week I just did a one-way ticket if I was going to be there you know three days ended up staying a week and I think I golfed six out of seven days that I was boy. Uh, so that's where trying to get away from the game mostly mentally um came back to Atlanta and you know, golf the last two days here I got a friend in town so um definitely my golf game trying to come along staying away from the ball for now a little bit but you know body wise we got back in the weight room and trying to mix in different things get my body back what's that what's that handicap like the handicap's still bad you know I sh I'm still shooting 90 uh, I gotta right. break 90 here this line, but you know, it's all a work in progress. So, so com oh, yeah. So compared to the last falling off seasons, right when the season ends, you said you headed to New York, took a week off. How is that different from the past? Has it been a one week thing every year, and then you get get into the swing of things, or um, what's what's that been like for you compared to the past couple of years? Well, this has been this has been a lot different. The past couple of years, you know, honestly, this will be my first off season that you know I don't that I'm, I'm going into it healthy. Uh, you know, for when I first came to the league, I had a hand surgery going into the league. You know, the second year, I had a bunch of knee issues I was going through. And my third year was a COVID year where we didn't really know if we were in an off season. Uh, it was kind of in limbo. Last season after a playoff run, I had ankle surgery. And so it finally, in a lot of ways, feels like this is my first like, true off season. I'm going into it healthy, can, can attack my workouts right away can attack the golf course right away. Um, and so there's a lot of different things I'm excited about where, you know, I'm not, I'm not, not on the shelf trying to fix myself and um, not doing any sort of rehab. So it's kind of something I've been excited about going into this. So far. Have you been watching the playoffs or have you just been totally taking the total complete break from the game? No, I've been watching. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of the game. Um, you know, really at all levels. Uh, you know, it, it definitely hurts to watch, but you know, really, our, our next series, you know, we lost to Miami. That, that game won Miami Philly. I was locked in. Um, I've been really watching most of the games every night. Um, just big fan of the game. Like to see it. And um, it's been a good playoff so far. Anyone you're rooting for in specific? You can't root for anybody. I think <laughs> I, I want everybody to lose because, like, <laughs> I don't want them getting a ring before I do. So, I think so you're no, not – I think you're not far off. It's been pretty shitty, honestly, overall. I mean, there's been a ton of blowouts. I mean, it's shitty. It, it's I think it's been a pretty shitty playoffs compared to last year. I mean, if you think about it, Kevin, your two games of the series were two of the best games of the entire playoffs so far. 
from two teams competing for 48 minutes is what I'm getting at. That's all I'm saying when it comes to shitty. Yeah, we're getting great individual performances and um, great team performances, but um, what, what have you seen throughout the playoffs? What have you enjoyed um, besides your series, obviously? Yeah, it's kind of definitely been been the unknown. Uh, you're going to each game, and it it has been a lot of ways. It, it feels like it's been, you know, one team wins in a blowout. You know, they, they go into the next game. The other team makes a lot of adjustments. They come out ready, and they win in a blowout. Um, I think that's happened in a lot of ways in the West Coast and the Western Conference. It feels like Dallas, all those you know, the games that they played in Utah, or they won, or they're getting blown out. They're getting, or Utah was blowing them out. Same with the Phoenix series. Uh, obviously so far in that first Golden State series. Um, so I think it'll get a little bit better. I think it's just teams kind of figuring each other out. I think it truly shows you how different a playoff series is in the regular season. You know, you're seeing the adjustments. You're seeing teams play each other a different way. Um, you're Obviously, you're seeing the home crowd have a big uh, – you know, had take a big toll on, on teams that you're going into away buildings. It's tough to win on the road. Um, obviously, Dallas was able to tie the series back in that Phoenix series, went in two in a row at home after going down 0-2. Um, so I think it's – you find little nuances that you can appreciate, you know, watching a playoff series. And, um, you know, so far I think I think teams have continued to – you know, the adjustments they make, almost like they figure each other out in a couple games. And, you know, all the adjustments that continue to happen, obviously, that um, – you know, when they go into it, it's that, that's whoever comes out and wins the series. So um, these playoffs have been great. You know, for me, just watching, I love watching the individual players. I think obviously Luca has put on a show. Um, I loved watching Drew Holiday in that last series. And I get tweeted about him, just, you know, loved how it, his effect on the game, you know, same with Marcus Smart right now, you know, his effect on the game, you truly Incredible. feel his presence. So even though the team performances might not be as good, I think like you talked about the individual performances of, have been right up there with any other year. I will say, um, you know, the Boston Milwaukee series, I thought was really good. I mean, there were a lot of games that came down to the wire. Even even Golden State and Memphis had a few that came down to the wire. That was game one or two. Um, the one where, the I think the first one where Ja was out, where it was like a slugfest, and then Golden State took the lead in the last 40 seconds and pulled away. So there have been some good games. Um, I mean, the Dallas-Utah series, I feel like, had had some, you know, some that came down uh, and were close as well. I will say, on the whole, though, I agree with you, blowouts, trading blowouts is not fun for a series, right? You want something more competitive. Um, but I, I do appreciate and enjoy that. I, I would say as, mm, I think as far as at some point in the middle of the first round or the beginning of the second round, I legitimately had no idea who was going to advance. And I still really don't. Um, and I think that that is something that I've really enjoyed after a decade of LeBron and the Warriors or LeBron and enter super team going to make it to the finals, you know? So just as a fan of the sport, the relative unpredictability I have enjoyed. Um, and I, I hope that continues. I do think there's a huge problem though, with these playoffs that, that has been magnified. It's a problem with the NBA and the playoffs have magnified it. And I'm curious to know what you think, Kevin, uh, how do you feel about officiating? Do you think the officiating has kind of mucked things up a little bit? And do you think there's some room for improvement there? Easy yeah, there, easy there, Ruth. Yeah, I was over my son in it. Get fine. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely always a it's definitely always a hot topic. It's one of those things. It feels like every year there's there's points of emphasis that you go in and uh, and they're very strict and they call everything for really the first month or two, and then you see it kind of teeter off and they don't make the same calls they were calling. And um, it's a superstars league. You know, obviously, superstars they get a lot of calls that other guys don't. Um, but I can't appreciate seeing how tough it is calling our game. So with, with how good players are nowadays, how good we are at manipulating calls, um, manipulating referees. And I mean, you're seeing Luca is now, you know, his, how he's learned from guys before him, the James Harden, even how Trey has learned from guys like James Harden, just drawing fouls. Um, you know, the different scores that we've had, obviously with Giannis. I think you can make the case, Giannis, just like LeBron in a lot of ways for a couple of years ago, you can make the case Giannis gets fouled every possession. It's just, you know, how hard he gets fouled, how hard you, you want to call it. Um, you know, with Golden State, their movement, are they pushing off every time? Are they getting held every time? There's there's so many different things that it's it's, it's tough to call the games as referees. Um, so I can appreciate that. And, you know, even sitting here as a player and, and wanting to say it's been tough to watch and uh, wishing calls differently. 
But at the end of the day, I think, you know, for me, if, if the relationships between players are ref, meaning if you both respect each other, if you're able to have conversations, I think that that goes a long way. Um, and it's not always like that. But, you know, in the playoffs, I think, you know, with, with the stakes of the moment, um, you know, obviously how much how much is riding on each call, I think, you know, for the most part, it hasn't been too crazy. It hasn't been too bad. I'd rather them swallow the whistle than call everything. So, hey, yeah, so that, that's what I was going to ask you. And I guess you just answered it. But just to clarify, your, your preferences lean towards uh, letting calls go instead of keeping things tight and calling every calling everything. Yeah, I'm a big thing. Like, you can't let refs decide games. You, know, you, you let players decide games, not refs. And so at the end of the day, as, as long as it doesn't become a, a football game out there, I think for the most part, if, I'd rather them swallow the ref and let swallow the whistle and let you play a little bit than you know, we're out here calling every ticky tack foul and all of a sudden you have you have superstars are going and sitting on the bench and I mean and it and I think a lot of his fouls were fouls but you know that Dallas series Chris Paul I think it was game four or game five or some you know he he's fouling out in the third quarter and all of a sudden so a guy like that has a major emphasis on a series all of a sudden they lose that game and um, they, you you just can't have that and um, so I'm a big thing let players decide games. So let's say Chris Paul has a relationship with refs on the court at about a 10. I'm just throwing his name out there. It could be. Let's just, let's could, just throw out Chris Paul and I don't know, Scott Foster, maybe. Right. <laughs> Their relationship's closer to a zero, let's be honest. But um, Chris Paul and referees, let's say it's a 10. Maybe it's around a six or seven. I don't know. But where would you say on a one through 10 scale, 10 being the best, like your relationship um, with referees on the court is? And how do you develop that relationship? I think it's about as good as it can be. And for someone in my position in year five or going into year five, I think, you know, those relationships and I guess whether they're good relationships or bad relationships are developed over years and years of being in the NBA. And so Chris Paul now being in the NBA, what is it, 15, 14, 15 years? Scott Foster has been in the NBA even longer than that. Um, those relationships kind of year by year, you continue to develop it. You learn, each, you, know, you learn how they make calls. They learn how we play the game. Um, you know, I don't have too many tech career. I think I'm only at three or four tees. And I believe three of them are from this year. One from it's like my preseason game of my first year as a rookie, I got a tech. And so um, I think it's about as good as it can be. Obviously, the more you play, uh, the better you are, the more respect you get. So just I'll trying quit. to get up there. How quickly did you learn every single ref's name? Um, that's actually something that I took pride in trying to know. You could walk out and you could call them by name and have those conversations. So I think I'm about 85, 90% of the way that where I can walk on without going and looking at the box score. Um, uh, you know, what, what these refs, what the ref's name is. Cause sometimes in mid game, I go in a huddle and I don't like a call and I'm going up to hey, they're going up to a assist coach like, hey, what's his ref's name? Like, I have to go up and talk to him. And we're looking at the box sheet in the middle of the game, trying to see what his name is. Um, so that hasn't yeah. happened too much, but it's a slow process trying to learn it. So just for clarity, by the way, because I looked this up because I, I was interested when you said it. Uh, CP 17 years deep, going going on year 18, which is crazy. That's think about at, at his position. So switching gears a little bit, um, let's let's kind of talk about, you know, you and the Hawks, right? So. Last season, you guys had that awesome run to the Eastern Conference Finals. I really thought once, uh, what, once Giannis like tweaked his knee, I thought you guys were going to actually do it and go to the finals. Obviously, fell short. Um, and then you come back into this season and kind of a rocky season, probably relative to the expectations. End up in the play-in, win, win the play-in, and make it to the playoffs, and then lose right uh, to Miami. So can you kind of walk us through? I guess the the ebbs and flows of going from conference finals and then that being the bar to then falling, I think, well short of your expectations and kind of the mentality of the team, you get that in stride and then what's what next? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's obviously it's been a roller coaster last couple of years. I think um, you know, our team, we're on a good path. You know, we're in the lottery a couple of years. We could draft picks, um, start with JC, you know, Trey, myself, you know, DeAndre Hunter, Cam. Um, so I think we built up a good core over a couple of years and obviously at the bottom of the East for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden we overachieved really fast. And, you know, we got hot at the right time. And, um, and you, know, you thought it too. I, even before Giannis went out, I thought we won game one in Milwaukee on the road. I thought we were winning it all. So I'm like, hey, this is the best team. We think this is the best team left and we just beat them game one on their own court. And so you know, our confidence was obviously through the roof and um, you know, fell a little bit short that year. And 
you know, I just think mindset wise, you know, we weren't where we needed to be going this year. I think, you know, we maybe thought it was going to be a little bit easier. Um, you know, I think talent wise on, on different nights, we show that we can, we can hang with the best. We can be one of the best and we can score with the best, most importantly. Um, but we didn't bring it every game. I and mean, we, we especially didn't bring it to start the year. And so we dug ourselves a whole early. Um, you know, we have a lot of guys that, you know, including myself, I had a surgery last summer. I know Clint came in banged up. Bogey came in banged up. Um, you know, JC was banged up most of the year and you know, COVID hit us hard, kind of in a bad time. And so there's a million different excuses that, you know, a lot of teams had to go through different adversity. Uh, we went through adversity. It really feels like right at the start of the year, dug ourselves a hole. And then it was more than anything, it was a mental grind all year, you know, from, from last year, when we finished our last game to the start of training camp, I believe it was 10 weeks, mostly all the guys were hurt. All of a sudden we're, we're five games under 500 and, you know, we have to climb ourselves out of this hole for the whole rest of the year. You know, we'd, we'd win seven in a row. We'd go lose five in a row. I think at one point we lost 10 in a row at home. Um, and then we ended up finishing the year as one of the best teams at home, like record wise. So it's like, and we pick that up, but it, it just, it was such a roller coaster year, roller coaster year of emotions where we would put together a good two week stretch. We'd be motivated. We'd be into it. And, and then we would relax a little bit. We'd get over 500 and it was like, we try to take a deep breath. You guys try to take a game and get their bodies right. You know, that, that relaxation, all of a sudden we'd go and we'd lose three out of four. And so it was just a battle all year, honestly. And it was one of those things that it all just, it, it began with how we started. We just didn't start it right. Then come in with the right mindset that we dug ourselves a hole. And it was obviously a hole we couldn't overcome, um, made into the play in and, and again, kind of proved that, you know, in certain in certain ways we belong on that stage I think we belong in the playoffs and competing against the best and um just ran into a really good Miami team again banged up you know Clinton John would have been huge for us in that series but uh in a lot of ways it's good for us I think going to this offseason refocus and you'll come back in September October ready to go so talk to me about overachieving in your eyes and like the differences between last year and this year because yeah I mean I think they both were roller coasters and um to me I mean some might think I was crazy but as soon as you guys signed bogey and gallo and I have a tweet out there that says this I said if everybody on your team develops right because I believed in you guys and the Phoenix Suns core that you guys had what it takes to win a championship on paper if everyone develops their full potential not saying you guys were at your ceiling yet but um I just thought the pieces fit and you had the potential on the roster if it got there um so you could blame injuries for this year, okay? There's a lot of injuries throughout the year. But if you look at last year, too, DeAndre Hunter only played 23 games, okay? Um, he's a key player on your team. Cam Reddish, 26, and he was a good role player in the playoffs for you. Um, and then Bogey played 44. So there's key injuries throughout last year, too. Um, how do you, like, decipher the roller coaster from last year and this year? And um, why did it work out last year? I mean, just because you guys – we're playing with house money maybe and the expectations weren't as high from the outside. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, and that's a good point. We definitely had injuries last year. I think in a lot of ways, the makeup of what those injuries looked like looked different. Um, Trey was healthy for most of last year. I was healthy for most of last year. Bo was healthy for most of last year. We had these good vets. I mean, you know, two, we had Tony Snell. Tony Snell is one of my favorite teammates of all time. Just an incredible dude. Tony Snell shot like, what was it, 60% from three. Then we had Solomon Hill. 57, yeah. 57. You know, Solomon Hill was the ultimate role player, the ultimate glue guy that just played hard to his role. JC, JC and Clint for most of the year were healthy. They, that gave us our size. That gave us our rim presence. And so we missed DeAndre. Like we're, we're a better team when DeAndre was on the court. But for our makeup last year, you know, filling in with Tony and Solomon – was we made it work where this year, you know, losing JC, we didn't have a backup really for JC. You know, Gallo coming off the bench and being a 24 scorer off the bench is a huge advantage for us that other teams don't have. Now all of a sudden Gallo's starting and that production behind him, that 20 points we had to find from somebody else and just just didn't have it this year. Um, o was the same thing. O was a great backup big all this year, just like he was last year. So I just think the makeup was different. Um, I think a huge reason why we were so good in that playoffs, I think in a lot of ways too, the playoffs are all about matchups. I think, you know, that Knicks series, the way they play, they played with two bigs all game. Julius Randle played the four. 
and Taj Gibson and Erlens Noel played the five. And so we were able to stay big all series. JC and Clint were able to record. And I'm taking I'm taking JC and Clint over, I think I would say any other any other four or five do in the league. If we can have them both on the court in those matchups and taking that, that's a major advantage for us. You know, New York, they had to play in pick and roll. They're playing with a five. So pick and roll, Trey was able to get going. We had everything. He's hitting floaters. He is he's a lob threat. He has me and Bogey standing on the perimeter ready to shoot. I think that matchup for us was just a very winnable matchup. And obviously, I feel like we should have swept that series, and we almost did. You go into the Philly series, same thing. Philly plays with Joel. Joel is arguably the best player in the league, but he's he's a five. He stays on the court all of a sudden. Clint has to be on the court all the time. They're playing with the four in, in Ben and Tobias that, you know, JC would kind of switch guard both of them. All of a sudden, JC and Clint for us can be on the court at all moments in the game. They have to play pick and roll. Joel and B chasing Trey around all game and pick and roll is not something that um, – you would say is a strength of their team. So again, we're able to play in pick and roll. We're able to trace it and float us hitting threes. We've lob throw. We've, we've three point. We're tough to guard. We get in that Milwaukee series. Again, Milwaukee plays big with Brooke Lopez, but you know, they're switching. I think bothered us. And that's, I think our next step in our development is they played in drop coverage. First game, game one, we beat them in their place. The rest of the series they played and they switched everything and we lose this year. We go to the Miami series. Uh, we don't have our size, which, again, I think our size in that series would have been our advantage. If we were able to play with JC, play with Clint, there's our second chance points. Um, I think we would have controlled the pain. Obvious, um, and we didn't have that. And you could say, look at the, um, you know, the guard makeup we had. I think, you know, on paper, you wouldn't say we're winning that. I think the, those are those are two things that go head to head. Our advantage in that series would have been our size and not having those guys hurt. Uh, but Miami, they're a great defensive team. They switched everything. They're in their shifts. They made us make multiple passes. And, um, you know, kind of showed us where our next development needs to get to. And, you know, Boston would have done the same thing. Boston has switched everything all year. That's that's why they're the second best, in my opinion, the best defensive team in the league is they switch everything. Um, and I think that's I think that's where the game is, is heading. That's what Golden State did during their really whole dynasty runs. They're able to switch everything on the court. And um, I think that's our next step is getting to that point. Yeah, I think two that's things great. that the two things that I agree with uh, big time that you said first is the importance of the role players at the margins, right? Guys like Solomon Hill, guys like Tony Snell that, you know, to a casual fan or just to, to an average fan, when you're looking at the roster, you're not going to take those things into account. But over the course of 82 games and then over the course of different matchups, that stuff matters, right? Like, for example, I, I don't think you started most of the playoff run last season, right? So you're a weapon off the bench. Gallo's a weapon off the bench. Bogey was, I think, starting a lot of those games. And then things switch, rotations slim a little bit, and all of a sudden you're a couple bullets short. Not having Clint also, I think, huge, huge thing. I'm, a, I'm from Houston. I'm a Rockets guy, so I'm a big fan, right? I, I know the importance of Clint Capella, and he has been banged up pretty much ever since he was traded. Um, and not having him, especially against a guy like Bam and against a team like Miami that is going to switch everything and keep you honest. And then also I think it, it comes down to having another – you guys use Trey, obviously, as you should, on the ball a lot. Um, and then when you're switching everything, it can get taxing for one guy, especially at his size, to have to take that on um, and create and not really have the advantage of a specific match that he can hunt, right? Because you got Jimmy Butler, you got Bam, you got P.J. Tucker. Anybody you switch, I guess, except for maybe Spurs or Duncan Robinson, who's now been benched, um, is going to be is not going to be the advantage that you think. So all those things matter. Um, so moving forward, where do you see this team? kind of getting to and ending up you, you you started touching on it about needing to, to kind of evolve to that next step uh, east is kind of a beast you know boston looks boston looks like they're ready to compete for years i don't think milwaukee is going anywhere philadelphia can retool depending on what they do in this offseason if they keep harden how to build around harden and Embiid, um obviously the hawks and and so on and so forth so where do you see the hawks kind of getting to like like what do you think takes you to that next step i know you got to get to that next step but how do you think you get there yeah, I mean, obviously, in a lot of ways, we got to retool, we got to reload, just like a lot of these teams. I think, I think a lot of teams in the East got a lot better um, from last year to this year. Chicago being another one of them. We didn't mention Brooklyn. Brooklyn will be right back. Um, you know, Charlotte, I think, is coming up too. That um, you know, they'll be around for the next couple of years or so. And, um, so we're going to be mixed. It's not anything where, hey, we're going to speak into existence. We're going to go next year and come out of four or five seed. Um, I think it's one of those things we've. We'll see how different our team looks next year, first and foremost. But 
I think for us, everything just starts and ends on the defensive end. Um, it was cliche as that sounds, the two best teams in the East that are still playing were one of the two best teams in the NBA defensively. Um, the Warriors on the other side, I think just offensively, it's in a lot of ways it doesn't matter with, with how well they are offensively. In some ways, they just have to be okay defensively and they figure it out. And Dallas just has, has Luka and their one-on-one matchups. They're playing out of their mind. But, um, you know, we're the second best offensive team in the NBA most of the year. You know, we never struggled scoring the ball. Um, I'm not sure a team with Trey will ever struggle for a ball just with how easily he can just go get 30 um, and the effect he has with everybody around him. It's just for us, it'll always be the defensive end. How can we figure out that end of the court to, to just be good enough? And um, that's what it was last year when we found that group. Uh, I think we were in a place where it was it was good enough to, to get there and win it all. We just fell a little bit short and uh, we have to get back to that point. And we got to have a collective buy-in that um, you know, I'm not sure if it was there over the full course of this year. I was also going to say, um, to add on to your point, <clears throat> the remaining four teams in the playoffs right now, we're all in the regular season and defensive rating, all top seven. So, I, you know, obviously defense does still win. I, I looked the stat up a while ago. I don't know, if, I, I don't have the updated stat, but as of like a couple years ago, I, think, I don't think any team made the finals that wasn't a top 10 or at least top 11, 12 defensive team unless they had Shaq, Kobe, LeBron, right. um, yeah. some combo of that. There were like two teams that were the outliers, and I think one of them was was maybe the Pacers from, you know, like 99 or 2000 when they lost to the Lakers. And what is for sure them, a LeBron team? Uh, no, no, several of them are Shaq and LeBron teams for sure. That's why I exclude them because they're obviously, you know, some right. of the greatest players of all time. So you can get away without being a top defensive team if you have that. Um, I think the other one was maybe the Jazz in one of their back-to-back finals appearances. Um, but the Hawks this season, to your point, you guys were 26th in defense. Um, I think you finished the season by my unofficial count while we're on this podcast. So I'm trying to do math in my head. I think you guys finished the season 26 and 14 over your last 40. So you you did surge. Um could you maybe speak to, if you can remember at least, what might have led to that? Because you, you you talked about it earlier. You got into a hole, and then you guys got out of it. But it was a little, you know, too little too late, I guess, in the end. But 26 and 14, to, and you barely pushed over 500 to end the season. So what, what kind of, uh, if you can remember, fed into that? Yeah, I believe in a lot of ways it was our urgency. I think it was, it was our, at that point in the season. And, you know, we have in our gym, uh, we have the standings that are up there. They, they update it every day. And, you know, I think there's a point where we were about to start practice and Mac was like, guys, just look at where we are in the standings. And we were sitting maybe 12th or 13th and looking at it. And above us, we're like, we're in those teams. Like, if you put it, if you threw the ball up in there in the gym right now, I think we beat all those teams. And so it was, we had to just find it. You know, we had to find the urgency. We had to come together. Guys had to get healthy. Um, first and foremost, but it just, like I said, it just felt like maybe mentally, it's just the wear and tear of the season mentally and the downs, I think over the course of the year was not something that we were able to stay consistent in. You know, we, like I said, we'd, we'd win a lot in a row and we'd, we'd relax and, and we'd lose three or four in a row and we'd be right back into the same hole. And we lose in Detroit twice this year on the road in late games where we need those wins. We go and we lose on the road to, you know, a team that's obviously was top four in the lottery for last year. And um, I'm not sure where they ended up the other night, but you know, those are games you need to win for a team like us that are aspiring to, to get out of the play and get into the actual playoffs. And those are games we need to win. And we weren't able to find it in those nights. And that's just kind of epitomized most of the year, just those two games summed up and, and what our year looked like. And uh, we we're able to show it on a lot of different nights. We'd be a lot of good. We beat a lot of really good teams, um, but it just wasn't consistent enough. Yeah, but I think you just need to like give whatever you got to everybody else because I think you're as about as consistent as a player gets in the NBA. I mean, coming into your rookie year, I mean, to this year, looking across the board, just the way you played, your role you've played, I don't think it's changed that much. Um, I really noticed, I mean, your defense in the playoffs this year, I thought that was great and improved quite a bit compared to um, where you've been at certain points throughout the career. But um, offensively, I mean, it's, it is, it is what it is. You, I mean, you're as consistent as they get. I know you probably want to level up and continue to get better. And, um, I'm sure you will, I mean, putting in the work, but, um, what, why do you think you have been so consistent and what is that, that, um, is it your role that you feel like has been the same and you, you know, what you, you got to do every day, um, or how, yeah, how have you developed that consistency through time? 
Yeah, I think a lot of that is it's as simple as trying to be in a lineup every night. You know, I think health has a lot to do with that. I think if you're a guy that's in and out of the lineup, um, those first those first games back, first one or two games back, you're trying to find your rhythm and um, you could have a lot of ups and downs. For me, I know I've always taken pride in being available every night. Um, you know, I was I was hurt last year for this was a couple years ago, I think for, for two weeks, I had a shoulder thing going on and, and, you know, the little things of, you know, this guy's always hurt, you know, you see it on social media, this guy's always hurt or you're in the box or like people who have no idea. I think that was something that I never want to be labeled as a guy who's, who's not in the lineup, who's not available. And so I think my avail my availability, the more I'm in the game, the more you catch a rhythm over the course of the season, you learn your role, uh, you learn where your shots are going to come from. Um, you learn how to play with each other. I think that's a huge part is literally just simply being on the court. Um, and the rest of that is obviously learn your teammates, trying to play winning basketball. I mean, you know, that's something I'll, I'll always do. I've always done is play a winning brand of basketball that, that might look different every game. You know, some games are uh, trying to be more aggressive scoring the ball. Other games, it's, it's trying to get guys involved and, and being a ball mover. And then obviously defensively, um, you know, effort is a lot of it. So, you know, just night in and night out, trying to have that effort, trying to be a guy that sets the tone for us on the defensive end and uh, get up and pressure the ball. And um, it's for me, just kind of always just try to pass the ball and be available. What about from like a coaching perspective, though? Like what kind of expectations did coach put on you from a role and just a growth expectation from your rookie year till now? I mean, how has that changed, if at all? Yeah, no, Coach Mack, the second he took over, has, has challenged me specifically a lot to to guard. Um, you know, I think with with Bogey, with his him being banged up, you know, I think inserting me in that starting lineup in a lot of ways is is to be the perimeter defender in our group, um, a guy that can guard a lot of point guards, can guard a lot of two guards, and and just try to affect the game and bother the ball. You know, Mack is a big guy with you know, before every game. Um, you know, he's talking about ball pressure and getting up underneath guys and making them feel us and um, and trying to throw him off and so that's something he, he's always challenged me with and, and and that heightens when you get into the playoffs and so um, you know he's you know coach Mac for me he's been great I think he's someone that's been very consistent his message is, is mostly the same every game um, if you're going to play hard for him he's going to play you if you're going to if you're going to move the ball you're going to play the right way he's going to play you and if you don't play defense you're probably not going to be in the court you know, he's always preaching he wants two-way guys and so um at times we've been able to show that we have a lot of two-way guys and um, at different times we haven't, but I always try to be one that is. Yeah, um, and shout out to David Millen. He was in consideration to be an assistant for the Rockets before he joined Atlanta. So I was sad when that didn't happen for personal reasons. And then obviously Lloyd departs mid-season and you, know, you guys turned it around under Nate. Um, so it seems like he's had a very positive impact on you guys as a team and obviously you individually. I was going to ask, uh, so you came in to the NBA in the same draft as Trey Young, right? And I was I was curious to know if to what extent you feel like he's just made the game so much easier for you, or if that's not the case, or if you think you know, hey man, I could have ended up on you know, I don't know, the Spurs or some random team where you don't have this All Star talent, um, you know, All NBA type guy where you can just kind of play your game and really ease into your game three and D while he handles, you know, the, the brunt of the work. Uh, but, but what's it like, you know, what has it been like playing with Trey and how has he made your job easier, if at all? Yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun, honestly. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's truly for me, it's, it's so funny to see just how dynamic and how dominant he can be night to night and like truly just control the whole game, especially from the offensive side of the court. Um, you're going in and obviously he walks on the court. I think he's, he's kind of labeled as, as a villain at some point at, uh, over the course of the career. He's, he's not someone who walks into a lot of away arenas and um, you know, people try to get under his skin and people are booing at him and chanting at him. And um, That's something that that's never affected him. And um, just the confidence that he plays with, but just, you know, his overall effect on the game and the offensive end of the core, like there's so many games where he controls the whole game and he's, and he's truly unstoppable where he's head and feeding all of us out there. He's, he's in pick and roll. He, he's giving you, he's giving Clint a lob at the rim where Clint basically just has to touch the ball. He's falling through or, you know, he's making skip passes for shooters. Um, anytime. Yeah. You know, and you have to appreciate this as a player because not every team has this anytime that, you know, another team has to double one guy. That's a huge advantage for everybody else. And there's teams that don't have that. There's there's teams that don't have a single guy that 
that you go into like, hey, we're going to double his ball screens or we're going to run at him at half court. We're going to do him in the post. And, um, and, and we're one of the teams that has one of those guys. And so the rest of us just have to be good around him. We have to figure out our role. Um, obviously, we know Trey is going to have the ball in his hands for, for a large portion of the game. Um, and we got to figure out kind of how to play off of him in a lot of ways. And so I think we've, we've, we've grown a lot together. Uh, we've built up together. We've, we've lost a lot of games together that I think we've learned from. And um, I think we're at this point of seeing in a lot of ways what it takes to win in this league and, um, and how easy it can be to lose and how tough it is to win in this league. And I'm uh, just like, excited to move forward with him and continue to try to build this thing in Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, he, the, the game of basketball at the end of the day, it's about many things, but the, one of the main things is about is getting easy buckets, right? If you can get easy buckets, you're giving yourself a very good chance to win. And stepping on the court night in and night out with a guy that immediately is going to demand a double team through s- certain junctures of the game automatically gives you, you open buckets and a chance for easy buckets. So I, I couldn't imagine guarding him, honestly, because you can't hand check, you can't touch, and he's so quick and shifty. I couldn't imagine guarding him, but Zach. No, and I think that like what you guys are saying right now is a part of the problem why there's been so many blowouts. And um, just by the numbers, I mean, the blowouts uh, by playoffs have been increasing. And that's just because of the variation of it becoming such a make or miss league. I mean, in such simple terms. I mean, people relying on the three ball and um, just getting open looks. Like for instance, Dallas had... 48 three-pointers uh, their last game, and 44 of them were basically wide open. They just missed them all. And so that could be the simple um, telltale in the next game here if they start falling. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you, is this the toughest you've ever seen Trey Young get guarded in this Miami series? Because I thought they did a tremendous job, and, I mean, it was it was scary from his end, and, I mean, it was, it was tough to see. I mean, he, he definitely – um, from being the domination, the king of New York last year to Miami, just having him in a bottle most of that series. But, I mean, he, guys were injured, so he didn't have the help he needed either. But what do you, what do you think of how Miami played him? Yeah, Miami did great. You know, it's their connectivity on the defensive end of the court um, you know, was eye-opening. It was something I think we noticed from game one, just – you know, their communication on that end, you could tell they practiced. Um, you could tell they're they're ready for us. That was really from game one. You could tell we walked into that and they're ready for us. And and they were like, we're not going to let Trey Young walk in here and get 30. You know, we're going to make somebody else beat us and, and get off the ball. And uh, we're going to rotate and be connected. And um, and it was truly, it was it was one of the things we about the rest of that series is, is like Miami was connected and uh, and with each other and. Um, you know, we got, we got into a hole. I think it was tough, you know, the, the way we started that series and how tough it was for him to, to get easy looks and, and get off the ball and, um, and for him wanting so badly to, to have success on that in the court and, uh, maybe struggling with the shot a little bit that, that every player goes through, but then just the attention he was getting, it was, they were switching everything. They're running at him at half court, doubling him, um, you know, hand checking him at every call. And it was a physical series that they were calling and, um, but I think it's it's something we needed. Um, I think for most of that series, we kind of got our ass kicked. I think you know it took us a couple games to truly figure them out and realize what we had to do, and um, you know what we were able to win game three, I believe, at home, and uh, had a chance to win game four at home. That that would have completely changed the series, and um, we just weren't able to do it. And you know you see what they they did to Philly, um, even with Joel coming back, Miami was able to figure them out and win a game one at uh, at home to Boston. I think. You know, we lost to a good team. I think we can appreciate that. that you know, we truly lost to a really good team, and, and that's a team we could point to and, and say, hey, you know, if we get a little bit better at these different areas and, and we work a little bit harder, you know, we're, we're a little bit more connected, uh, you know, talent-wise. I think I think we're the superior talent team in that series. They're, just, they're a better team, and there's been a lot of different areas. Of the hey, you heard it here first. Superior talent. That's a talented team. You guys are talented as well. Um, Kevin, we appreciate your time, and I- I got one more question for you, and I think Zach's got one more, and then we can wrap this up and get you on your way so you can go hit some golf or uh, get that car registered so you don't get it. So, uh-huh. <laughs> the DMV in Atlanta has got to be wild. It's funny. It's actually a funny story. I got pulled over on the way to a playoff game. They tried to impound my car. So I was like, this is a this is a whole thing on the way to that. It was actually – it was the game – it was game three we won. 
Nice. Three to one because my car's not registered. I got pulled over on the way to the game, and the cop tried to impound the car, and uh, we had to call him a favor to get out of it. But it was it was literally I was my mom was in the car wearing my jersey, and I'm like, bro, on the way to a playoff game, like you can't just, <laughs> can't let this go. Like we're good. Can you tell that? So can, can you tell the details just real quick? That's an incredible story. Yeah. No. So I was I was driving on the way to the game. This was before my shooting time. Um, my mom's in the car. I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, like there's lights behind me. And right away, I was like, I don't, I don't know why I'm getting pulled over. Like, I'm not speeding. I'm not doing anything. And, and he walks up to my car, and he's like, hey, your car's not registered in Atlanta. Like, we need to fix this. And I'm like, hey, you know, it's, we've been in season. I've been able to get to DMV, blah, 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 blah. And so you know, he goes away, and I'm being super nice. I'm, and honestly, like, I didn't, I didn't try to pull the card yet. Like, you know, like come on. Come, let us go. Hey, what are we doing here? And, uh so but he took forever this cop he took like 20 minutes and like I'm, I'm at this point like almost missing my shooting time you know your pregame time and so we're sitting there and uh and he comes back up to the car and he's like hey sir like we're gonna we're gonna impound your car today you know your car's not registered you can't drive and and i'm like dude like are you kidding me like i'm going to, a just, just to pause <laughs> you real quick like you can't just be a, a your place in new york is that right yeah, New York. You can't just have New York plates driving through Atlanta. It was it was expired, so I had been oh. expired for about a month. Gotcha. So it was like you got to stroke the red yeah. velvet, man. Come right. On. So then, I, so then from there, it was like it was like, bro, I was like, are you we're doing this right now? Like, you got to do this right now. Like, this isn't something we could figure out at a different time. Um, and so and yeah, he tried to impound my car, and um, right there we we had to call in a favor. Um, yeah, the Hawks, the Hawks have a really good security team, and. Uh, this cop ended up, he had to follow me to the arena for some reason to make sure that I, I was who I said. And so he followed me all the way into our parking garage, let me park. And then, you know, I walked in all good, but I've been scared to drive now in Atlanta. Cause like the next time I drive and get pulled over, they're going to take my car. And so, uh, I've been Ubering everywhere for the most part, but just haven't gotten to the DM. Look, were you, one of were the, you driving one your the... mom's minivan or what? <laughs> that was my car she just happened to be in the car one of the worst things that people do is take themselves too seriously and that's the quintessential example of somebody taking themselves just way too seriously me too i'm like this is not something we have to do all right now and then it was like of course when he goes back to his car and, and he came up and i don't know this cop's name but like he was being difficult the whole time because back is like he's like hey like hi friends in high places huh like trying to joke around with me i'm like Bro, give me my ID. Let me get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Come on, bro. A game to play. That's so uh, funny. If he's a Hawks fan, if he's a Hawks fan, then that's extra douche. There's no way. There's no way he could have been. It was right away. He he had a thing against me the second he pulled me over. Man, well, that's, that's such a great story. I'll quick I'll quick share one. Timberwolves elimination game this year. I was so sad um, and bummed out. My my plates were expired. I got pulled over. It was rainy, windy. I was freaking out. I told, I pulled the card that I have two twin baby girls in the hospital. I'm just pleading to this dude. I'm like, let me out of here, man. And I didn't drink that night. And he still made me do all the, the breathalyzer tests and the walking the line. And this is pouring rain and windy. And I'm just freaking out because I'm like, I'm a diehard Timberwolves fan, man. I'm a wreck. And I got two twin baby girls that are still in the hospital. And he felt for me, got me out of there. If I can pull that card, you gotta, you gotta get better at that, man. <laughs> I try not to pull right away. I try to be, I try to like see if they're gonna give me a chance, and then later on, if you have to pull the card, you pull the card. Man, Zach, you had one last question before we wrap this up. All right, so we ask everybody, Kevin, uh, just kind of fun way to end the show, but uh, you can say, being your golfer, and I think this is kind of fun too. We can switch it to either a round of golf, or we normally do just a dinner. Um, three people you can go to dinner with or three people you want to play in your golf for some, however way you want to take the question here, but um, anybody dead or alive, um, who would you be in your dream foursome or dream dinner date? I'm going to preface it by saying I'm going to stick with athletes. It's so I don't have to go into presidents and, and world leaders and, and, and whatnot. So I'll stick to the athletes in this. One is obviously it's got Michael Jordan. Just for I would love to see him on a golf course. Yes. Okay, um, we're going the golf my, road. I like it. My all time is, is Mike. Is Mike your goat? Mike is tied with my goat. Oh, he's just thinking about the chance of in case he has <laughs> to play with LeBron someday. 
He's, I'm a no. I'm a little. I'm. A, I'm honestly. I'm a LeBron goat guy. He's yeah. He's in my era. I'm a LeBron okay. Guy. Okay. Um, Fair enough. But it's it's not like I've it's not like I have Jordan is two. It's like a one A. That, that's my guy. approach too. Jordan is my one A. LeBron is my one B. But I can respect it. Okay. So Mike. So I got Mike. Uh, my all time favorite baseball player is Derek Jeter. Mm. So I would toss him in that crowd. I'm not sure if he's a golfer. And then this last one is a tough one. Last one is a tough one. If I'm going another sport, if I go basketball is one. If I go baseball, so I'll, I'll mix in the football. I, I love to play. We go out like a Tom Brady. You could get the go to football. We could toss oh, him in sick. there. Um, I'll go him or Eli Manning. I'm a diehard Giants fan, oh. so him or Eli Manning. Oh, that's awesome. I love Eli Manning because I did not like the Patriots. So the fact that he took them down twice is like, honestly, it's one of the funniest foils, I think, in sports history. Like this dynasty juggernaut getting taken down by – Fucking Eli Manning. And the bragging rights up in up in the Northeast is all Patriots fans can't say anything. You know, they got that dynasty going. I got a bunch of friends that are Patriots fans. Like, dog, we beat you twice in the Super Bowl. Like, like we're forever ahead of you. What are you talking the about? Ultimate Trump guy. Exactly. That's a, that's hard to be hard to be trifecta of Brady, Jordan, um, and Jeter. That's I mean, that's greatness personified. That. Stick with the athletes. There you go. Well, hey, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. Had a blast talking to you. Uh, we wish you the best coming up with uh, with this upcoming season. Last last thing to say, this coming season, the Atlanta Hawks will. How far will they go? Atlanta Hawks will go. You can't you can't put that there. We're gonna have a better year than last. What's, year. what's Kevin right? Hurry okay. gonna do? Let's, let's will, roll it something. The Atlanta Hawks will not be in the play in. All right, we'll we'll do that one. There you go, and that works either way because you can miss the play in or you can make the playoff. So, <laughs> DJ. Hey, but Kevin, thank you so much. We appreciate it, guys. If you're listening, rate, subscribe, retweet, all that good stuff. Um, and until the next time, we appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Kevin, really appreciate it.